Welcome to another episode. My name is Sebastian Engstrom, and today Manesh Ibar joins me. He is a mystical spiritual teacher. He can focus on and understand what you cannot see, what you cannot hear, what you cannot feel. So we're talking about the subconscious mind. We're talking about spirituality, and we're talking about the masterpiece that he is bringing forth into this world, which is the Sphinx Code, which is personal subconscious architecture so what the hell is that well you'll get a reading if you do this and you'll understand your past your present and your future so what the hell does that mean well you'll get an understanding of your family patterns of your potential of insights that you didn't really see coming i was skeptical but I've been blown away by what this actually presented to me. We do a live reading, not the Sphinx Code, but we do a live reading on the call as well as some other goodies. I mean, he used to be the VP over at Sony. He took the traditional path and he was called to something, you can say, more extraordinary that he did not expect. Manesh has a fascinating story that we'll get into. And if this podcast is bringing you value, please, if you're on Apple, scroll down take five seconds hit five stars that means the world because this helps us spread this message to more people so thank you for supporting the podcast if you're on any other um, app that you're listening to the podcast let's say google spotify hit like subscribe even a review thank you for doing so and here is the conversation with manesh you are involved in many different things the spiritual aspect is your main focus the sphinx code is something that we have a connection between the two of us and what i was just blown away by the accuracy of these insights the cards and for anyone who might be skeptical i was skeptical because if anything is going to read who i am and what i brought forth to this world i'm going to bring forth and also my past as well as my family structure by tapping into some cards i'll be like yeah no so maddox maybe we start there maybe you can introduce yourself briefly in your own words and also why does the sphinx code stand out so much and what is the purpose of it yeah um so the the path of spirituality came to me pretty early and and it was kind of an edge and i think there's this kind of funny uh attitude that i have and and i would be exactly in the same fence in terms of you know tarot cards like that was the last thing for me uh i pushed it away very much like anybody who did that was very much the stereotypical psychic in the boutique in new york Mm -hmm. city that you go you know if you're drunk or desperate but you're probably going to get scammed anyways um and that that was the idea for me of the tarot uh but my spirituality and we'll talk about it uh deeper brought me to uh some other aspects um of the extraordinary and 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 really brought me to a higher performance and then eventually interestingly the tarot came uh, very much at the end of my spirituality uh, in terms of uh, my education I'll say or my initiations and 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 so I went in fully into it and in that uh, I had this very deep inspiration of changing the tarot from just a divination tool where you just kind of divine people and you pull cards to actually a system a system which is almost like a spiritual technology that actually unveils the subconscious architecture of people which is incredibly important uh in in terms of performance for you know uh business for athletes for lovers for everything because basically Mm -hmm. our subconscious uh governs our life and we're unaware of how structured it is because we don't learn about it And this tool came um, as this incredible uh, inspiration, basically, that started to align with all the other wisdom systems that I was studying, including human design and astrology and gene keys and 
the you know Mayan calendar, the I Ching, all of it, all these old systems, the Kabbalah, they all actually are kind of trying to say the same thing is is how to reach higher levels of being right mm, and, yep. and how to excel and so they unveil these mysteries or these secrets that were part of the uh initiations kind of like uh stealing fire uh by james whelan talks about like these mystery schools really brought us into higher elevated states of consciousness and awareness and therefore performance as human beings and so i was deeply interested in that and the Sphinx code kind of revealed itself uh, in a spectacular initiation with two others at one night. And for the last 12 years now, I've been basically uh, doing sessions with it and learning its depth and accuracy. And I usually get guys, CEOs, you know, that come up and they're like, their wife brought them in and they're like, what cards, tarot? Like, oh my God. And, and then they, sit down and get the reading and they're the ones that ask more questions they're the ones that call me back they're the ones that want to know like all their executives and things it's it's actually been quite funny interesting. and interesting mm -hmm. so i want to go back to the sphinx code but to really understand what the sphinx code is about i think we need to understand who you are at your core mm -hmm. and in your depth what what is your story how did you grow up where are you from like what what was what was childhood like and what is how did you become who you are today? Yeah. Um, the story of the making. I'm actually coming out with a book because there's so many different stories in that. Mm. I grew up in a pretty idealistic, uh, you know, upper middle class, even maybe a little higher. Uh, grandfather had seven companies in France, was an indigenous kind of Basque, you know, person that um, had that, that loyalty to his culture rather than the countries and was a bit of a rebel, but at the same time, a big businessman um, and very cultured, interested in the arts, all organic, but always teaching us how to live uh, sustainably. So we had this mm -hmm. kind of big farm uh, with animals and plants and food and, you know, the fruit trees and the vegetable gardens, even the flower garden to make the house beautiful. And so there was this incredible aspect and, competition and sports were uh, very much uh, a part of the lifestyle. And so the, I would say it's this ideal European bourgeoisie kind of upbringing, but with this kind of rebellious, you know, Basque uh, uh, grounding to it. And then at eight years old, I moved to the U.S. because my parents had actually met in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I went into a deep depression there. Uh, my life shifted so drastically in terms of the cultural shift. Mm -hmm. uh, and finding America to be very superficial, materialistic, you know, and, and very important in that. Wh that where that in the United States? What state? Right outside of New York and Connecticut. Mm, okay. Like the tri-state area, but this okay. is the, the, the golden uh, coast, as it's called. And it's all the, the big CEOs and Europeans mm -hmm. that are kind of brought for the industry of, of America, but on a leadership scale. And so it's all the boarding schools and private schools and all this kind of stuff. And, and you know, divorces and by 16, the guy doesn't have a driver's license, but he has a BMW and a Mercedes from mm -hmm. mom and dad. And, you know, and, and he doesn't even know how to drive and doesn't even care. So there's, I saw a lot of that very disturbed, let's say uh, elite society uh, mm -hmm. in the US. Um, and luckily, I you know grew up where I would go back to the Basque country uh, in, in the southwest of France every summer, mostly, um, and then had a pretty privileged outlook on, on life. Funny enough, like my grandparents were very religious Catholic, mm -hmm. and uh, at seven years old, I would go, um, you know, the whole Catholic schooling. But at seven, I would start laughing at the priest for his preaching because it just sounded ridiculous. And uh, I got kicked out of the church and oh. basically stopped uh, okay. going to church. And so by eight, at the same time as the transition, I thought basically, you know, spirituality was a hoax. It was hmm. for people who needed hope. It was just bullshit stories. Mm -hmm. And then by 14, um, I had an out-of-body experience in the woods, being a rock uh, a drummer and in a band. And we had driven for a long time. And I had to stretch my legs and went walking and, and just went into this very 
uh, weird forest that supposedly I learned afterwards was a, a haunted uh, burial mm -hmm. ground and protected. But anyways, I went into this and, and had an out-of-body experience that completely shifted my perspective of spirituality because all of a sudden I was outside my body connected to everything, having this unity consciousness experience. I didn't know what made that happen. And then I came back into my body, went back, did you know the, the, the gig. And what did you experience? I mean, you need consciousness. It's a very kind of interesting thing. So, I mean, first of all, there was this incredible fear that, that took over me. Mm. Uh, and, and that fear, uh, like I was taught to push through fear, you know, because there's always a gift. There's always something. That's one of my grandfather's teachings. <clears throat> and so this, this deep fear in the woods at night, you know, your imagination sparks off to mm. all sorts of things, including all the... <laughs> uh, scary movies you've seen sure and then you start deciphering and discerning those and you're like okay that's just craziness what is going on and I just kept moving forward up to a point where I actually just opened my arms and said okay I give up you know like whatever is around whatever it is take me mm. and I actually popped out like straight out of my heart and then basically saw myself floating above my body Yet I could still see with my physical eyes, but yet I had this other perception and I was outside my body mm. looking above. And my body was just in this position, locked. <laughs> hmm. And I remember I could see my shadow, which was behind me, but it started dancing and it started moving hmm. forward and around me, which mm -hmm. like, so my scientific mind, because I went into science and, and followed my dad, who's a physicist, and, and that was rational and, you know, like no bullshit there to find and seek the answers of life. Right. And um, and, and get me out of that depressive state. And it took a while to get out of there. But sports and music were uh, big inspirations. But anyway, so I find myself in this moment. And it's ridiculous. My shadow cannot go in front of me like that defies what a shadow is. Right. Like the light, the full moon was in front of me. Therefore, my shadow should be behind me, not in front of me, in mm. between the light source. And like, so as I'm, 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 I'm kind of going through that. Meanwhile, I'm also outside my body feeling the owl uh, connecting to the bats and the sonar systems that are going on that are actually connected to the trees that are also connected to the underground and the worms. And like, I just, I just felt, you know, suspended in this uh, other reality where you hit, I don't know, flow, uh, altered states of consciousness, where you see things totally different. And, and, you know, and you melt into everything is connected. Everything is interconnected. Everything is one, you know, mm -hmm. big, mm -hmm. huge being in a sense. And then the shadow jumped in me. There was a song and then I popped into my body. And then like, I remember my breath, you know, there was the dew uh of, of that october or november like mm. fall night in in connecticut and i was like oh my god i'm back in my breath i'm not dead mm. like mm -hmm. and then i realized oh my god concert you know and and ran and 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 went back to the concert and just back into reality like oh my god i have to deal you know? and then after the concert it would actually i mean it it played in my head where i couldn't really sleep because i didn't understand what just happened and I went back the next day and actually there was a Native American waiting with two chairs. And I went back with the guitarist who the guitarist was freaking out being like, what the fuck did you do? Why is there a Native American with two chairs waiting for us? Like, we're done. Uh, you know, he was like this badass, like, uh, and he, he said, you must be a medicine man. You know, and that was the first time I heard it. Um, uh, but that he wasn't my teacher. And that next time that I feel fear in a woods, it's probably some sacred ground and I should, you know, respect it and kindly move but I'll probably learn and to get the fuck out of here. Basically, that was <laughs> super welcoming. Okay. Um, and then of course I had all sorts of nicknames because of that medicine man. What? Like the guitarist, like start spreading it. The other guitars, the singer, the others, they're all like, what? It's like, oh. get at it. So for like two years, I wanted nothing to do with it. And then by 16, I, I, the curiosity just, just completely devoured me and I needed to find out what did I experience? What was mm. that? Do I need to get back into some type of spirituality uh, mm. that is more practical and real rather than 
religious and uh, and and I, I started seeking that um, my aunt uh, was a bit of a hippie and that she adventured in the 70s into all sorts of different things. So I asked her about ceremonies because my parents were not, they're, they're more science and mm -hmm. I mean, open-minded, but definitely more, uh, I'd say, following the curriculum of culture, right? Mm -hmm. So cool. did you pursue the physical, a, a, a regular job or what? Did you know early on that, okay, I'm going to go down a different path? No, no, not at all. I actually thought, well, I mean, besides the the teenage dream of being a rock star, which like, you right. know, I was in a rock band, so of right. course we wanted to be rock stars, but um, that that faded. No, I actually went deeper into physics and, uh, mm -hmm. and then eventually went to Carnegie Mellon, like had the whole engineering aspect, then moved to NYU and got a, a degree in music engineering. I'm looking now more into even studies of uh, uh, sound frequency architecture in a sense. Mm -hmm. As you see, there's there's a studio and, and sure. music has never left me. And it actually, I mean, it, it's interesting because I see, I got this, uh, my clairvoyance popped when I was 21 uh, at NYU actually. Hmm. So I see auras, I see energy um, and vitality, which actually there's a bunch of people that talk a lot of horseshit about that. Actually, um, it's kind of interesting that we've moved from seven chakras to nine chakras. We have nine in-body chakras. That's why our world is more complicated and is evolving and consciousness is heightened and, and we're embodying more consciousness, basically. So that whole energetic system is, is quite interesting. And I discovered that kind of like a scientist that all of a sudden has these you know awakenings that mm. are happening to him and i don't really know why and my spirituality was kind of on the side of okay well you know some people are jewish some people are catholic some people are buddhist i'll be this other thing yeah. whatever that this thing is and i actually went into buddhism a little bit uh, my, one of my music teachers brought me to buddhist classes and weirdly the buddhist meditation which was shocking because I, I had this whole visual trip during the meditation he came back and he described everything i saw I was like, how did he get in my brain yeah you know and then he actually said you need to go see a shaman um and, before, and before before going into the shaman i'm curious so with this ability that you have does that work over technology as well or is that like for example would you be able to see something with us talking right now, speaking to Ori or so forth. And it's okay if yeah. it's not. I mean, it could be in person. I don't know, because I don't have that fine-tuned ability. I've got, I've, we can get into some of the things that I've seen and experienced myself, but yeah, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, it, I, I do a lot of uh, my work through Zoom sessions mm. uh, very much this now, especially with the pandemic that became um, even more uh, prominent just because of, of movement. Otherwise, there's certain people that still like the, 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 the physical. And so it's a good question. Technically, um, energetically, time and space in the quantum field in a sense is, is irrelevant, right? So my frequency resonates in the entire universe as mm -hmm. my frequency, just like yours. So as soon as I'm tuned in to your frequency, it doesn't matter where in time and space you are. We can actually travel into your past, move into your future, into your timeline, depending upon the access you give me, for example. Mm. And it's probably at a subconscious level, on a soul level. And so I can, I can read you and the energy uh, just as easily, sometimes even easier than when I'm physically present. Because when I'm physically present, our energies are going to start melding and creating... Mm a unique uh, dynamic or almost relationship, uh, which actually the Sphinx code shows us is like, you have your individual chart then in a relationship, there's an extra chart that shows up and, uh, and, and it's the relationship energy in a sense. And that has influence on the two individuals, right? And it's, it's the uniqueness of being with others. I mean, teamwork and the military group work, like business executives, it's 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 super important and, and it's to me how you can achieve a higher level is connecting to the other especially energetically and so when we connect physically sometimes actually the energy is more difficult 
to read. I mean, you almost have to, to, to have more discipline of reining your energy in to be able to read to the person rather than through technology, which has this kind of separation, but then allows for me to tune in uh, to your frequency and, and what's going on there. Would you be open to doing some tuning into my frequency? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like right now you have, so I work first with the energy centers and you have four centers that are having issues, I'll say. The first and second chakra are pretty essential. Uh, and at the same time, most people in society have those broken. It's massive pressure on the physical body, money, our roots, you know, where is our lineage from? We barely know our grandparents. Oftentimes we've been moved. Uh, so there's this massive pressure, this false scarcity programming that's going on that puts massive pressure. So the first chakra is out and then the second is also out. So that can be all sorts of different things. Uh, and I would have to ask questions. Um, usually it's an emotional repression that's that's blocking that second chakra and not following your real desires or wants. Hmm. Uh, it can play with hormones. It can play with uh, emotions. It can play with your vitality. It can play with uh, a depressive versus joyful feeling. You can be just kind of satisfied, but it's not this fucking you know wow i love life you know like and sure. fully engaged um and then the other one that you have is the you're stressed like it's your solar plexus hmm. uh so your care stress and, and perhaps confidence issues uh that you you have probably from your father's which then i start getting into that but then uh there's a block also in your ajna um so you probably had a program of how to not be emotional from your dad and expect to be in a certain way uh, to be loved. And, and that conditioned physically and stressed your body to hold some of your emotions and intuition and block them into your body. And you do this still uh, within. And so with the, with the uh, Ajna, I would have to ask you different questions to see what part of it. So are you able to focus, for example? For long periods of time on and off do you have dreams um that wake you up or do you do you have uh, a lot of weird disrupted dreams kind of thing more so lately been having trouble sleeping lately yeah okay um so yeah your your brain is basically probably overcompensating at night when you're not busy in the awakened state to deal with all this repressed emotions. And so you're having all sorts of trouble. You need to go pee, et cetera, and relieve the emotions. So probably doing more sports, sweat, saunas would help that. But eventually it's about uh, releasing the power that you use to repress some of your passion, your power, your, your emotional uh, desires in a sense. And, and it's not the animal instincts it's it's really like a refined emotional state of being and and you know some of us are wired and it seems like you are with a certain intensity and a certain mood swing that goes with it where you have high energy at times and then lower energy and you'd rather be high all the time you're putting this pressure to be that way when actually it's a wave and and you need to kind of probably move through your wave which is dispersing this energy out into the world, which is actually tapping you into the new spiritual consciousness hmm. through emotion, the emotional consciousness. But our, our world is, you know, doesn't want to hear about this stuff. So thank you for reading that and sharing that. And I'll give confirmation. <laughs> and I'll give confirmation to the listeners who are, who are, hearing this this is nothing that we prepared this came out of left field so this question yeah, exactly. that i had and yes i have been in a shift where i've been focusing the last more than past of the year of all right how do i make this podcast and business for work in this realm and i went very spiritual very connected vulnerable and emotional in the very beginning but i did not know how to make that into reality but that is my truth 
that is the calling of my soul. So I went into, okay, what do I know in my head? And a lot of this stems from my father of right logic, reason, money. How do I start making money as quickly as possible? And I went into what I know very well, and that is strength training and working out. So I focused on that. And I've realized through trials and tribulation that that is, that is not my truth. That is not my calling. That is not how I can share, inspire, and bring wisdom to this world. So you're hitting on multiple aspects that are very true and alive and also the blockages. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you're sharing this. This, is, this has been coming up and I've been denying it as you've been denying it in the past too. It's just when I don't take the time to settle down, to be calm, to meditate, to even work out less because when I start working out more, I start getting more in my ego. So it's, it's an interesting dance that of surrender and trusting that there is more and trusting that there are people to connect with on this different realm and still function as a fully functioning high performer in this world, but being connected in multiple different levels. So thank you for going into that. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, because you're open to it. And, and obviously, I kind of go deep and it's personal. Uh, you know, you just brought up a really interesting point is because I deal with uh, I'm pretty expensive. So I deal with high performers that usually are already successful and they want to go to that next level. And in order to do that, you have to deal with your energetics. You have to deal with your emotions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that's that's where your cap is going to be yep. blocked and you're not sure. going to be able to go to that pro or super uh, human level and uh, that's that's really it's refinement and it's unfortunate that even medical schools or our, our education system has not uh, adopted the quantum physics knowledge which has basically said yes there's a field it's an energetic field this is most likely where memory is held consciousness it's outside the body there's there's things that are pretty mind-blowing that we've now proven rationally many times over on on many different peer review type of experimentations and the quantum freaks us out but this is actually where we're moving towards right it's it's really moving out of this very rational and we're moving into a chaotic kind of system mm -hmm. i mean the quantum is difficult like there's there's 16 potentials of you <laughs> you know and at each moment you make one choice automatically the 16 different other parts of you in different time space realities are reacting to that choice and making different choices you know it's it's it, like most people can't deal with this reality and they're like what do you mean i have 16 different personalities like spread in time space but yeah the mystics were telling you you know you have to go in and talk to all these spirits your own conscious awareness your own you know different aspects of your own frequency and so like music going back to music music ended up becoming a a thread that stayed constant through both my physics and my spiritual teachings that brought me through many different types of initiations that made me see the magical the extraordinary that you know i got hit by lightning i died in the pacific oceans in a vision quest and was saved by a whale that then taught me how to throat sing because she was talking to me. I mean, stuff that you're like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? But they're real. Like they, they happen to me. And, and, and I have that kind of rebel spirit that's like, what? Because I'm always logical, scientific, and trying to almost disprove <laughs> my spiritual mm. experiences, right? The whole time that I'm having them. And yet I think that brought me into a unique awareness uh and, and 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 i see spirit and spirituality through the lens of frequency you know like literally the energetics is is a start of frequency those are your base frequencies and then we can go into your aura and we can start seeing how to unravel the programs which is basically your belief systems that were dogmatized by your dad even just taken energetically by being with him and around him and in his way of manifesting his own genes and since you have those same genes you have a resonance he has priority over it he's pushing that expression to be in the same way which is why you know like in a way death is quite interesting because when you're 
your parents die, they, they lose the weight of how they express their genes on, off of you. So all of a sudden, you're free to express your genes in a different way. Mm. That's, that's intense. Like, we don't talk about this during, you know, death rituals uh, and, and burials and, and, and actually like, hey, this is an incredible opportunity. You, you've, you've actually been freed in your own genuine expression of your genetic material. So share with me this. I'm curious as we're touching upon this. I moved to the United States 12 years ago. And a big reason for that is I did not know how to separate myself energetically, expectation wise, from my parents and from the life I was living here. And a big representation of the United States was freedom to me. So I've been considering this a whole lot lately as I'm back in Sweden now, as this energetic intensity is very present, but it's different as I know myself and I'm more grounded now. Can you create that separation of energy while still being alive? And if, how? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is so in kind of always looking to be that scientist, right? I, I came up with a lot of methods and, and I call them spiritual technologies. And for a while, I called myself a spiritual technologist mm. rather than shaman, which I guess some people say, well, that is what a shaman is. Um, uh, and that's all discussion. What is a shaman and mm -hmm. how did like that, that start coming up and uh, to being called that? But so there's, there's certain energy technologies, mostly through meditations, visualization, and, and the visualization is, is wild. The way that you can work with your consciousness and your energetics is thoughts create and move the energy, which mm -hmm. then materializes in the physical. So if you're envisioning it, you're actually creating it also. But actually the vision is coming from it being alive. Okay, but then moving it and changing it by your own perception shifts it. So there's a course that I, I have online. It's called Clear Essence Meditations uh, on Teachable. Mm -hmm. And there's 24 meditations that basically teach you the energetic field and how to master your own energetic field to have your own energy hygiene so that you can actually, you know, go through all your chakras, cut cords, this, that, and the other, replenish them, clear everything that's in your aura, which includes belief systems. So you could see uh, where's that belief system coming from and you can see which aura it's from and where or if it's in multiple layers of your auras who it's connected to usually there's a cord that's attached and then you can be like okay dad or you can just say you know i want to see all the different belief systems that dad has on me they'll light up and you'll see them and then you can actually remove them you know and actually deal with them consciously or just mechanically where you're just cleaning mm -hmm. and then you're dumping every day or you go in and it takes more time and you see why did you have that belief system that was attached and then it'll show you a memory. It'll show you an experience where you had emotional power into it. And then you'll, you'll be able to integrate it, that conscious awareness and then evaporate it um, if you want or not. Mm -hmm. And then there's other things I mean, there's contracts, there's entities, there's, there's the whole energetic system, but it's pretty simple. I mean, you know, 20 within 20 meditations, uh you're, you're pretty done like you're you're safe you're in control you're you you understand a lot of the spiritual knowledge uh and and it's effective it's just that it hasn't been out there and i don't understand why and so you know i moved my lazy self to actually get it done mm. and and, it and and have the animations with an artist so it's available out there and that's that's kind of like your base energetically. It's, it's working with your energetics and in terms of high performance, this is key because you have to have your balance energetically. Almost like if you're neutral, you have more chances of in a way inspiring that divine and, and weirdly performance means being in form of the divine hmm. per form ants per it's so like inviting the form of the extraordinary, the divine, the, and then you're putting it into action. Mm. I looked into that because somebody had uh, had said, you know, spirituality is not about performance. I'm like, what? It's <laughs> actually kind of interesting. Like, I think it actually is all about performance. And so, you know, if you, even when you think of the uh, the master of ceremonies, there's there's a certain 
you know, of the circus, but actually of a spiritual ceremony, like the priest or the Pope or uh, the Dalai Lama, whoever, the shaman leads a ceremony, there, there is a certain performance and, and the grace in your performance can actually bring more spirit to it. And uh, it's good, uh, uh, an act and an art to do that. So I truly resonate with what you're saying. And I'll tie it back to what you were saying before. If you have, when you reach a certain level, you will start to understand that I can't get past this level, regardless of how much I study, how much I make, who I'm connected to, or if I switch jobs. If there's yeah. something different. And you'll start connecting. Hopefully, you'll start getting these hints if you're open to them. And the more you're open to them, you'll start getting these hints that unless you clear things from your past, unless you start connecting with yourself and knowing who you are and also connecting to something higher, then you won't move past that next level. And I've been so resistant towards that. No, like, mm -mm. okay, okay. Like understanding psychology, who I am, how I tick. How, who my parents are and so forth, but connecting to something higher. I'm like, no, especially coming mm -hmm. from Sweden, which is a, not a very yes. religious country. I have a, there are a lot of atheists here and I come yes. from a very science background as well. Not from my mom's side, but that is what led me to open up about this. But that is such a key thing that you're speaking to that once as an executive, as a high performer overall, once you start connecting to those you can say woo woo things almost, but those all out of body experiences and understanding who you are, not just as an individual, but how you connect it to more things and start opening yourself up to something more and surrendering. Then you start grading, gaining greater access to yourself, to others, and to possibilities that never even thought it possible because you're so much up in your head. But if you're connecting to something greater, you get so much, so much more. Uh, capabilities into tapping into i mean what, what you can't even imagine so yeah that's you know yeah, it actually leads us to this really interesting question and and i think eventually all high performers in whatever aspect have to face this the the it's willpower do we have our own willpower mm -hmm. Or do we have divine willpower that we have to submit to at some point? And therefore, yep. we don't have real free will, right? And, mm -hmm. and yet, it's, it's this really interesting dynamic of you have to almost like prove to yourself and to the universe that your free will is activated, is trained, disciplined, and badass, you know, mm -hmm. at a certain peak level yeah. to then be able to surrender it to the divine and then the divine comes and takes over and then you reach those like moments of like the extraordinary and and that's the trick right so you can't just not have free will and discipline and willpower and just be like well whatever it's like i'll go with the flow blah, blah. like that that won't lead you anywhere because right. the divine in the universe is like what is that like you can't do anything with that it's that discipline of the ego's willpower and this is where the ego starts getting involved right it, it's going to start taking credit for the extraordinary that starts happening right, right. as the dance of the universe and your own free will start happening and eventually you know uh, uh, it's an interesting question is there real free will or not and mm. and are you co-creating with the universe or or not you know and, and all this manifest your reality manifest your dreams you know like is that is that real or is that are, are we actually watching a movie that's already passed and we're experiencing it you know, and and then and so that's an interesting thought too. And we get into these discussions when we get into space code, where you actually start seeing the mechanics of things, uh, and and you know, birth and your parents and why the parents were the parents, and, and what's deeper behind the psycho emotional programming behind it that you actually called and made them act in that way because you needed it. You know, in your evolution, I mean it's kind of, it starts becoming like really interesting. Yeah. So tying that into, we were at the point where you're connecting through music and your story here, and then Buddhism came up. So take yeah. us back, take us back. What were, what happened next? First of all, 
I was saying with my hippie aunt, I, I, I asked her about a full moon ceremony because the full moon was very present during that night where mm -hmm. I popped out of my body. So I was thinking maybe I can replicate this with another full moon experience, right? That That is spiritual. So she gave me the name of this guy, Jackie, and number. I called him. He's in France. And I was in France for like two weeks with her for some reason, like before going to the South, I don't know, waiting for my family. I was in this waiting state so why not try something totally off my path right mm -hmm. and this guy happened to be a shaman and uh and a wizard and uh, his one arm blue eyes long white hair like very much merlin looking like and archie fire then there was with him which is a lakota sioux uh who was doing the anipi uh, uh, initiation which is like a sweat lodge and so i, I went in and, and did the sweat lodge this was around 16 and it it, I saw the whole energetic field. Uh, it, it blew my mind. I mean, it was like complete magic. You know, I was like, what is this again? Yeah. Right. So I was like, what the? And then we were in a TP. So, I mean, there's a lot of fears because I got there and I was like, oh my God, this is a French like commune or cult. And they're all mm -hmm. trying to become like Native Americans. You know, there was TPs everywhere and blah, blah, blah. But actually, the ritual in itself and, and uh, Archie and Jackie's wisdom powers chants all this stuff just awoken something in me where i had done saunas you know uh, in sweden and finland and all that and i loved the heat but this was like something else there's like people emotions were flying out things were moving in energy was moving in you got women crying men crying kids laughing and you know i mean it's just like i was like wow this is uh this is different and, and with the songs that brought in different meaning and, and spiritual essences if not even spirits uh and and so i started this practice of doing soil lodges i'm actually doing one this weekend i haven't stopped uh you know for 25 years every month i do soil lodge and it's a it's a really grounding and, and a beautiful experience and the cleansing and purifying and bringing you back into um, nature's alignment so that's been an incredible tool but again to me it was a, it, there's a certain technology so i really went into it and learn that. Parallel, I'm going to school and then I'm moving through uh, the engineering program as well as the uh, music tech program. It was a tone master program. So it's, it's master of tone at NYU. And, uh, and having conversations, having Buddhist teachings as well in New York with Three Jewels and uh, Michael Roach uh, at the Quaker Center, which kind of was interesting. Um, and then these meditations and then another shaman woman from Ecuador that I started working on, on journeys, like with the drum. So it's reaching this altered state of consciousness through trance with the drum and then voyaging through different mind spaces, which is to me actually what the core shamanic study is, is, is they've mapped out the mind through different cultures, but through many different trances. And they, they have places that everybody can connect to. And, and they've kind of mapped out the subconscious in a different way. And, and these shamanic journeys with the drum are amazing to understand yourself on a deeper level in your subconscious, in the mysterious, in the occult, in the, sub, you know, like the, the, the archetypal uh, aspect to you. And, and interestingly, I mean, you're, you're connected to so much. It, uh, it's 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 amazing to discover yourself you know you have several animal totems you have like a spirit council uh of guides that you can go to i, I have a friend famous artist uh olivia that always says you know i have to go to my board meeting and she goes mm -hmm. into a spiritual alignment with her council and, and has like a board meeting about her life you know and and i find that to be absolutely appropriate um because that's what we should all be doing right? because it's available one and and it's easy to do it's not it's not this magic trick that somehow um science has has and religion has made us to believe that it's unreachable and yet actually it's an innate aspect of our birthright mm -hmm. is to be able to connect to all of this right <clears throat> So the sweat lodge is one of those experiences where I've surrendered the most in my life. 
because of the sheer <laughs> exhaustion <laughs> and heat and fully being able to just surrender to something. So this was in Mexico. I did this. And, yes. uh, but it takes a toll on your physical body. How, how do you keep a healthy physical body to be able to be a fine tuned instrument for the soul and these, this connection to take place? How, how do you, how do you find that balance yourself? Yeah, that, that's a, that was a whole journey. Um, coming from more of an athlete and then actually having to change my perception of using my tool, my body mm. for something different, like channeling, for example, and spending a lot more time sitting yep. um, became kind of interesting. Uh, definitely climbing mountains and, and going out in nature and, and walking is, is a huge piece for me uh, physically. But um, I also like, so I went much more into the core like doing pilates and, and core body work um which keeps balance keeps your inner uh aspect um in a way aligned more like you mm -hmm. know being able to sit for our meditation like it actually takes a whole different type of muscles mm -hmm. um and and then i did uh and i do a lot of qigong uh, which is working with uh, the basic principles of martial arts, um, which is moving energy. And it's allowing energy to move through you rather than you moving the energy, which is, is a whole different way for us to perceive how we move. You know, like if, if, you, if you can be completely in flow, you're allowing the energy to move through you and you're maybe just manipulating it a touch to amplify it through your body and then you discharge it i mean that's the, the the magic of martial arts when you see masters that you know can do this and then mm -hmm. like 10 feet away there's like 20 other guys that are like starting to float and like bounce around and you're like what just happened mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, it's it's all about the chi and so the flipping that prana breath work deep uh meditation and then moving that energy through flow I did yoga for a while, uh, and that was amazing, especially in New York, um, creating that flow. I, I was very elevated, felt like I was floating before going into work, because I, I worked at Sony Music. I was one of their youngest VPs. So, you know, like I've been kind of a high performer my whole life, like, you know, uh, state sports athlete and blah, 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 awards, this, that, and the other. And, and my teachers, I think that a lot of the great teachers that we're always checking my ego like they love the willpower to meet the divine but as soon as my ego would say check me out you know they i just get railed like and i mean it was just like railing so i was able to um to learn to humble down and, and to move with flow of life and it took a long time because i resist a little bit like you and like my rational mind is like no 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 yep. no mm -hmm. i'm doing the woo, woo until you see that it's einstein that actually called it woo, -woo. You know, it's the woo-woo science, which is actually what he was talking about. It's the quantum field where he was like, woof, can't even deal with that. It's, it's too crazy, but yet. So uh, let's get into you. So you stepped into music then after school, I assume. And then yeah. you climbed the ladder. Yeah. So it was, it was, so music was always a part, you know, I DJed, I was in other bands, um, singing. The, the drumming of meditations uh, for shamanism, you know, it's this drum and rattles. And, and so there's a the music and then there's toning. So I use that and, and I love that. Moved into that. And then it, it just, it, it kept coming. Like, so I, I, I started meeting a lot of different shamans. I started doing swell lodges. A lot of people, I mean, it's a small world, or at least it was in the 90s. Like nobody was doing it. You know, like spiritual awakening. Was, I was not my my sony you know uh mates were like this guy's nuts he goes on weekend trips with india he puts feathers everywhere like whatever like he's yeah. crazy but yet there was an intrigue but they were like that's not us you know there's one guy who was studying buddhism so he would come and he's like yeah i'm different too you know i'm studying buddhism it's not different you know and i'm like yeah cool um so 
then after that, the, the teachers just kind of kept coming and just brought me to different levels. Um, and and with this energetic gifts, I, I'm, when I stopped working at Sony, kind of, I had this big Native American dance called the Naraya that 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 took it takes you like basically you dance for three days and and spirit takes you, floors you, comes into you and gives you such loud vision. You know, no drugs, no plans, nothing. It's just dancing and singing. <laughs> And in that vision, at one point, they said, you know, in six months, you're going to be in the mountains, in the Basque country, living there, and you're going to be basically a healer. And I, like, I was at Sony trying to become like a, a super media guy mm. and retire 45, you know, or 30, uh, whichever came first. Like, and, and, and so I was like, what? Like, this vision is insane. Like, am I going to be in the mountains in the Basque country, like living there? This is crazy dance. So six months later, I was in the mountains in the country, living there, like, <laughs> <laughs> and running around, being like, "What am I doing? Like, how did this happen?" And yet, it was perfectly natural. And 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 so then people would be like, well, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I'm kind of listening to plants and listening to nature and hiking and discovering roots and and this and that." And then I got even like a scholarship for that, where I was like, "Great, now I'm getting money for it. Like, this is hmm. weird." And, and then, you know, people started uh, really calling me from Paris because I, I, I also had a, a girlfriend that brought me to Paris and she gave, gave me a lot of different clients because I had healed her back uh, through my energetic kind of like clairvoyance and seeing it. Mm. And I would do that to friends. I would kind of like, you know, help them fix them and this and that. And they'd be like, oh, thanks, dude. I don't know. And eventually all my teachers kind of called and said, you know, this is going to become your practice. You, you need to charge money for this. And I was like, no, that's not part of my uh, moral code yet. And then this girlfriend brought me to Paris. I started with an argument. I agreed to see all her friends and, and then there was all these results. And, and so then I moved out, moved to the South of France and, uh, and stayed there. But then, People heard about me and so they would keep calling me and so that's my job started. even though i was thinking no i'm gonna go back into the media you know google's gonna call me anytime soon blah 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 i had headhunters that were you know uh, uh pitching me and then that all didn't come like at all like it just vanished and, and mm. the calling of going deeper into nature doing this kind of work energetic work just started to become completely prominent uh, and then I started working also a lot deeper with uh, John Milton uh, doing vision quests and, and where you basically go out in nature for an extended period of time fasting and, and that like took it to another level, took the sweat lodge to another level basically. Uh, and up to the point where I've done 44 days alone in nature and it's, it's pretty dramatic what happens, you know, in, in your body and your consciousness and in your level of connection and your in your lightness. I mean, I remember coming back and playing sports after that. My, I remember my dad and brother were like, what the fuck did you play while you're out in the mountains? You know, like, and it was no, it was because I was in total flow and, and, and it was easy. Like it was literally, I knew where the ball was going to be before and I could just be there. And so I could take perfect form and, and, you know, it was really interesting, like playing tennis and things like, that. um, and, <laughs> um, so please share more about this 44 day journey. Jim Quest is a rite of passage that's uh, pretty amazing. It's, it's which actually Mike, the artist that connected us, uh, has done as well. And, and this is actually how he found out about things for this through his vision quest, because I, I hold these um, now for the last 12 years. These rite passages where you basically get instructed in, in teachings about how to interact with nature when you're going to be alone for a certain amount of time with no food and real basics. So traditionally you would get a buffalo hide and you go, you make an eight meter circle and you'd stay there for four days, four nights, no food, no water, nothing. I, with John, learned that because I that <laughs> with Archie and it's, it's pretty, I mean, you think about water so much, it's, it's pretty insane. So with a little bit more comfort, like a tent, sleeping bag, some water, you get just the same effects in your physical body. And I think you can actually go deeper in your contemplations uh, because you're not starving uh, water, which is so essential. And your body really is like fast. You go into ketosis, which is great. 
not having water, you go to a whole other level. And for most people, it's too brutal. So anyways, I, I take people through this journey um, where you go into deep contemplation and connection with source, with nature, with yourself. And, and you're basically um, bare bones. You go back to nothing, you know, like to, to your being. You can't really move out of anywhere. Uh, you can go out of this mountain. I mean, you, you can, but it's, it's, it's a, a deep effort. And, uh, and so staying with yourself, you have to face your shadow. Hmm. You have to face the dark night of your soul, right? You have to. And so the first two days, you're trying to escape because that's where you're going. There's only that destination. And then by the third and fourth day, you go and deal with some of your, your stuff, your parent issues, your lineage issues. I mean, I remember just massaging my intestine once and, and you know, in a meditation uh, which you do with your body, you just go and check in because you have so much time. And the intestines like, starts talking to me about my whole lineage, lineage, about how I have the intestines of my, you know, grandfather and his grandfather and blah, 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 blah and this whole thing because it's actually too long because we're more fruitarians, but we, we don't live in an environment which can sustain that and that and that in a society. And so that hurts your back. I was like, what? Hmm. <laughs> and eventually when I came back off, I asked my dad and sure enough, like it's a deep lineage thing and there's this issue with this long intestines and I hadn't heard it and I was 33 years old, you know, and I was like, what? Like, dad, you, you want to tell me other conditions that we have, you know, like you want to share this kind of stuff? So it's interesting that like, you, you really have so much information that's unveiled. The way that I call it is wisdom quest because what I feel is instead of a vision, which you, you have many visions, you touch upon your own wisdom. We each have innate wisdom in our soul and and we're not taught in school to go and discover that you know mm -hmm. so usually it's through life experiences eventually we get old and we get wise but there's ways of accessing your own innate wisdom at 14 at eight years old you know if you if you are trained mm. most 14 year olds are not into wisdom they're more into sex and falling in love but you know <laughs> sure so with these what well, mike our common connection the artist he shared he was in hawaii i believe it was 10 days he was in a cove without any f is it any food or is it some food i can't really remember yeah no please, food please please speak to that experience to me that's like insanity like for i've <laughs> heard of i've heard of like all right five seven day fasting I personally, what happens if I fast even for a day, I start losing muscle mass. Maybe, it's, and I've heard it said, like we have different type of energetic imprints in our bodies and I have more of the um, imprint of um, the trauma of not feeling safe. And therefore my body type, it, um, it fades, almost starts fading away. If I don't put in a lot of food or if I work out, I start getting very skinny. So that's a fear of mine is to do fasting for a long amount of time. Please, please share how, how does that work? And, um, yeah, going into that experience. Cause Mike, I mean, he was just bewildered by what he, the realizations he came to. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. There's a guy in England, um, who came and he had the same fear, mm -hmm. um, as you, because he he's pretty fit and 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 he's like i have no body mass to lose so i'm going to lose my muscle yeah <clears throat> and i told him look like you really there's a point when your body's going to stop because it's still doing that from a wounded place so so it might do that for the first two days because that's what it's used to but by the fourth day it's going to stop because you're going to stop it you're going to stop having the mechanism of of you know eroding yourself of, of mm. uh, effacing yourself you you have to deal with becoming consequent and, and he did like on the fifth day it happened to him um and he went into complete grace and and, mm. and harmony with nature i mean it was, it was really like amazing to, to hear him say that and actually he he gained muscle mm. uh, really? because of course he did push-ups every day and <laughs> and <laughs> but but so yeah instead of losing it like he, he lost water weight but, but, you know, like nothing uh, extraordinary or uh, like just very normal in terms of fasting. You, you lose some of the, the water uh, first. And 
the five days, so the five days is the first um, amount. I like to push people to really go do seven days. Then there is nine days, then there's 14 days, and then 28, and then 44. That's kind of like the cycles that I was brought into. Um, seven days, like the five days to me is, is a great base because the first three days, your mind really, it's like your ego mind, psycho-emotional being fights. Mm -hmm. and 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 it has to break down and, and in a way you can even see it that the ketosis hits after the second day in a way um and and really takes effect and that's actually going to shift your mind already but also you just by the constraint and the loss of distraction right there's no more tv there's no more people there's no more phones there's no more anything messages coming up and there's no responsibilities except for just sitting there and thinking about mm. your situation. Like the first two or three days are, are I'd say painful, but, but um, familiar. Mm. Mm. <laughs> cause you know, these thoughts a little bit, it's the next few days that are really amazing. Cause you start going into a deeper place where your ego and your mind get tired and, and even your physical body, and, and so you deflate to a certain degree, you, you, you surrender. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point, um, which then moves you into this emotional state where all these repressed emotions start coming up. And, and so you have this emotional day or two. And then by the end, the fifth day, you're having realizations, which is why I, I tell people to push for seven days, because though there's two days of revelations, basically, and, mm -hmm. and you're just getting wisdom after wisdom. And already even in the cleansing or purging process of the first three days, first two or three days, you're having a lot of realizations. Like what are your hooks? What are your distractions? What are, you know, your, your go-to systems and habits that actually are destructive for you mm -hmm. because your, your ego is just irritated and, and it brings up frustration. So you go into that, um, whatever it is, the chocolate <laughs> or the smoke or the uh, fucking, I'm not going to do this or that. And, and so you learn a tremendous amount about yourself and it's just with yourself. So there's, there's no shame, there's no guilt or is there, you know, why are you shameful like, about yourself? Why are you guilty about yourself? So you start revealing those and you unwind it. And then you literally like a lot of the weight for me that I see is not the physical weight that people lose. It's the energetic weight that they lose. Mm. Their auras beam. They they just expand because there's there's no more shit and gunk, you know, like mm -hmm. they they've cleaned it, which is part of the prep work beforehand. The first two days, um, I work with people on their belief systems, their programs, their energetic troubles, and 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 I guide them uh, towards meditations, exercises, breathings, and and things to do to reopen and to also move that energy. Uh, including oils and flower essences that I put in their water. And that's my customized kind of vision quest. Mm -hmm. Others aren't like that. And then usually at the back end, uh, we do, well, at the front end, we do a sweat lodge after the teachings that kind of brings them already to surrender. And then they go up. And then at the back end, um, I provide plant medicine uh, ceremonies mm -hmm. where we really go deeper into just in case they didn't go into <laughs> some corner. <laughs> okay. we go through that and so by the end you know there's a there's a real rebirthing that happens uh into your power i mean you you knowing yourself it goes back to plato it is the crown jewel of enlightenment it is like every, what everybody's looking for we want to know how to perform in the highest level of our being to do the greatest amount of impact that we can in this lifetime whether we're meant to be lovers then okay i'm going to be a lover for you know this whole life or okay i'm gonna go do this work or that or whatever your soul missions are and we each have a, a, a genetic design literally and a conscious awareness to work together and offer that up into the world right so mm -hmm. what are the tools that can help us into that so eventually my spiritual path took me towards these tools what was astrology okay it's interesting but wasn't specific enough for me I found uh, human design and, and that becomes way more scientific, more specific, 
really interesting with the matching of the genetic um, codons. And yet um, I started having these interesting things where I was like, there's stuff that's a little bit off, you know? And, and so I'm gonna get really nitpicky and, and, and you know, I wear my shaman police kind of uh, t-shirt. Uh -huh. There's manipulations that happen in the human design. Um, and, and, and yet it's really an incredible tool to use to have self-awareness, but on a very deep level, there's some manipulation. Most people, it doesn't affect because most people have a surface reading and it's it's good enough and but it's for the practitioners that are really the seekers of how things work there's some manipulation um and so we've been doing a lot of that work of decoding human design decoding gene keys where did he get all his information because gene keys is kind of a, a system that came out of human design the the scribe for Ra, richard rudd ended up having an epiphany of seeing the genes in a different way and so he kind of designs a different path according to your genetics. And this is where Sphinx code kind of came in. So I was hanging out with some friends and you know, you start hanging out with weird spiritual people uh, mm -hmm. once you're on this path and, and having funny discussions. And this is um, what happened this one weekend. And we all were discussing personalized systems. Like this is where the, the future is going is we all need to have these systems that give us personalization. Mm -hmm. So our genetics is one thing, but then we need to know our minds. We need to understand our energetic body and we're all personalized. So all this homogenized treatments of healthcare and food diets and sports, it doesn't work because to, to get to these peak levels, we have to find our individual tuning. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so we asked the question of why tarot was not a personalized system. It should be because if it's supposed to be this like Holy grail of an information of, you know, all of uh, the wisdom of the past and then before the uh, Egyptian takeover, let's say, and, and our culture was kidnapped, there was this knowledge, the, the, the mystery schools, and, and somehow the tarot has this knowledge, so how? And we kind of channeled, tuned in, meditated, went into a higher frequency and, and, and asked the creators of the tarot to tell us, you know, if there was another way. And I mean, immediately, like we got... Uh, a spirit that came through and just started downloading information into the three of us hmm. and the three of us witnessed this and we all really uh i mean the the, the whole calculation the, 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 everything came down really fast it was more how do we how do we write all this information you know and it started showing us all the cards and like with the placement and so luckily we were able to stop go back in stop like rewrite it talk about it freak out about it um you know <laughs> like what is this and then uh and then um and then and then there was this thing that 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 i started using in my session so i would do human design and then in the back of my mind i'd do the calculation of the sphinx code and i'd start kind of using it it actually made me really lazy clairvoyantly mm -hmm. because like like instead of me going into what i just did with you where i would just I'm just going off of your energetics. Because Sphinx code tells you your subconscious archetypes, I can start by knowing the Sphinx code. I can go tap in just by the knowledge of what your mom was like, what was your dad was like, yeah. and, da, 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 and go into your whole upbringing. And, and, and so it made me lazy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the, the, uh, the, the tool being clairvoyant really helped me uh, refine the descriptions of each of the cards in their positions and seeing so many different clients mm -hmm. um, also reaffirm that. And so for the last 10 years, it's been kind of like in the testing environment. And for the last three years, I started teaching it to people to become wisdom keepers and do readings themselves. And, and that was the last like trial for me, like the scientific evaluation is if if it's not my gift that can do the same, then then it can be passed along. Then it can be, you know, scaled, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and uh, and and actually be practical for much more people than me. Because I mean, doing one-on-one -on -one coaching is limited, right? And you want to have a bigger impact. It's the same thing physically. I mean, you can you can have these really amazing people that you work with, few, and then then and, and live great, but there's still this thing like I've learned so much and especially when you have this kind of wisdom system 
you want to open it up to the world. You want um, people to have access to this incredible tool. That's mm -hmm. been my little secret sauce in a sense. So why the name the Sphinx Code? So when we uh, opened up the um, this question and the spirit came through, it was full on Egyptian. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, he, um, I mean, so so he went deeply into the 22 emerald tablets of Thoth mm -hmm. and, and talked about how that was the initiation that happened in this halls of the Sphinx in Nepal through this elaborate mystery school that supposedly was there. And it was a myth. It's, it's a myth. It's a, we, we, nobody knows if this is real or not, but we were told this by this uh, spirit, this energy, this consciousness. And, um, and so we related it immediately to the Sphinx because this is the guardian of this knowledge in a sense. Mm. Um, the Sphinx also is a mystical creature that uh, is represented in one of the Arcanas, um, which is the Wheel of Fortune, and he's there. And it, it's kind of the epitome of um, the myth of our human beingness moving from animal, the lion, mm -hmm. to human consciousness, the woman, which really represents a higher state of consciousness. I mean, we're two men, but they definitely are on another level which creates all sorts of issues but anyways um and then there's the angelic realm the supernatural realm of the sphinx with the wings and stuff right mm -hmm. and so you have these three levels that humanity can achieve we have to move away from our animal instincts and being just the raw animal move into that compassionate human state of awareness and consciousness and then tap in to that higher spiritual realm that can start making us high performance you know have, have performers manifesting our magic basically mm. and so i felt like that was a, a great symbol of what this system teaches us is is to go deep into our, our darkness right our incarnation our, our animal nature and then move us into our our highest expression of ourselves and the fact that it all works with all other systems and, and actually the archetypes are fascinating because they're they're having a macro influence on the micro mm -hmm. you can see it in the micro but they're actually pretty pretty large they're, they're almost playing on a bigger level than astrology but actually because of their power they're 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 more poignant than astrology and they're almost as as defining as genetics but they're actually the ones that make genetics you know uh express itself differently through each of us because we have the same genes i mean we're human like right mm -hmm. around a level it's like 99.9 percent .9 we're going to see ourselves as human mm -hmm. is that 0.01 percent that makes you you know different than me <laughs> which is very few genes and mm -hmm. what plays with those genes that make us so unique actually so having this reading done for me was there was a lot to take in and then and to implement it usually that's the integration phase that's the difficult part and i'm still because there was so much to take in i'm i wasn't really sure how to integrate it how would you when you've taken and done a Svin's code and had a reading for you how do you integrate it how do you keep it alive yeah i mean it, it, it's an interesting thing i've seen um certain people they get it and they go straight into an action that was mm -hmm. told in the reading where there is the harmonization um archetype that basically teaches you and tells you like here's how to move in a direction by going into this energy you're going to force ships mm -hmm. you're going to force an alignment right and so you're going to deal with some of the information that was told in your incarnation of your masculine and your feminine being challenged by moving into your harmonization key which is going to also help you shift your ego which is this conditioned wounded uh, energy field that you've created and constructed as the personality identification system yet it's from all the wounds and so you have to break down this identity, almost like go through a transformation, dying by first moving into the harmonization key 
and then going and shifting into your upper uh, ego or your evolved personality, mature personality that then pushes you into your soul mission. And what you'll see is the the archetypes, the, the images start coming into your life where you start seeing them like in your business you know you might be working and then all of a sudden you're like oh yeah that's that sounds like what mike said about mm. whatever cards you have or whatever um archetypes you have you know like for me i have like a pope like so i'll be like oh that's like the pope like here i am like preaching and talking shit about you know <laughs> and um and okay well there it is uh, about spiritual matters oh there it is like you know um and and so you start having these kind of smiles of being like oh yeah that's that's that part of me mm -hmm. and then you know when i go into relationships like i have another like other archetypes and you start seeing oh yeah look like i'm falling into this attitude obviously learning more about each archetype um is is what's lacking so far uh and that's what we're trying to you know work on right now is publishing more information so that there's uh, more available for free for people to just start getting into the conversation of archetypes and, and especially the tarot's archetypes. Because I think there's been such a misinformation uh, on the tarot, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the English speaking countries. When the tarot was, was transformed into the German English decks, uh, Alistair Crowley and then uh, Tom Ryder shifted a lot of the tarot's original symbology and even some uh, of the ordering of the major arcana which has a massive impact on on what this tool is i mean it's like changing planets in astrology you know and be like actually you know we're like nine systems and pluto and neptune shift you know like they're the flip it's like wow like that would be completely different mm -hmm. and so the tarot especially in the English version that some of the archetypes have lost some of their meaning and, and some of their sacredness, which has also resulted in, in being a, a tool that is more for, let's say, woo woo, new age hippies and, and psychics that, you know, are just kind of starting out to a certain degree when actually it's a tool that is hyper scientific in a sense uh, and, and has the potential of being extremely, uh, revered in in this science technology in a sense yep. uh, or spiritual science technology i think that is a uh, just an uh, excellent way of wrapping it up this is spiritual technology folks so if if you're a bit on the edge of like i don't know this i mean there's 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 algorithms behind this like there's there's a methodology and and it's freaking accurate <laughs> like surprisingly accurate so how would people connect with the sphinx code and yourself how would they find out more about it so sphinxcode.com is uh is our main site right now and there you can uh, reach a couple of the wisdom keepers and get a reading uh or reach out uh to me at uh, manesh at sphinxcode.com or m-a-n-e-x and then um there's several aspects that we can do like from different readings right now we have the the automated pdfs that we we're starting to launch um we have a, a campaign uh for mike to finish all the tarot and in that there's uh some uh readings pdf readings that you can get immediately before you get your full tarot mm -hmm. and then otherwise um there's some certifications that are starting out in uh, february and march next year again uh, to become a wisdom keeper okay amazing thank you very much for sharing everything that you did and one thing we did not cover so maybe for part two is the being hit by lightning and the whale story so uh, and dying <laughs> <laughs> so oh I, i'm kicking myself for not going into that um <laughs> but thank you for everything that you shared today and what you're doing in this world freaking amazing thank you so much i appreciate it and uh, it was great to be on your program mm. let's do it again yeah i'll be glad to talk about that lightning strike <laughs> awesome manesh this is one of those people where your mind is blown after you speak to him i really wish that we could have gone into when he got hit by lightning and died on the pacific ocean 
for another time. But wow, he packed a punch into this episode. Please check out sphinxcode.com or Manash Ibar at any other social media platform that is out there. You have all the links to his information and the Sphinx Code in the show notes. And I am so grateful that you tune in today. Sending you so much love. Over and out. Peace.